Well, I do have a question then. I'll start. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Greg and Michelle, I know that this was a fabulous way to honor your friend and a great poet. I'm wondering if there were any stumbling blocks along the way where it was too close to him and too powerful where you said, I can't do this anymore. This is too emotional. I, I can't make a production out of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, there, there was some, um, you know, dealing with his death was sort of difficult in a way because um, uh, not a lot of people knew how he died. And um, there was this sort of, uh, when he died, and as you saw, we, we found the debt, we got access to the death certificate, which did reveal that he died of cocaine poisoning. Mm -hmm. But that had been for decades. Uh, his sister, I think Sheila, and a few others got together and they wanted to uh, sort of tell the world that he died from a heart attack. Uh, rather than reveal that he had actually died from cocaine poisoning. So when we found out that he had died from coke, you know, I felt as a documentary filmmaker, some responsibility to reveal that information, right? Because I had learned that about his life and didn't, didn't really want to feel like I was contributing to the cover up, you know. Um, so it was all very tricky because some family members didn't know that he had, you know, died of co cocaine. And so I had to uh, have some conversations with his sister and she eventually did say, you know, I think it's time. I mean, it's been 20 years, however long it had been. And so we kind of came together collectively and, uh, decided that it was time to reveal that. And then, of course, there were all these discussions about who tells that? Is, is it something that, uh, how are we gonna reveal that in the film? And I think ultimately uh, we decided to show the death certificate so nobody was really making that announcement. You know, uh, Sheila didn't wanna say it, Greg didn't wanna say it. Um, we didn't want Phil Levine to say it. And so, uh, you know, that, that was a tricky and touchy thing to work through, right? Well, part of, <clears throat> excuse me, part of what we had done is uh, those of us who were present when he died and knew the real circumstances surrounding it, we only half lied. <laughs> he did die of a heart attack. Unfortunately, it was a heart attack brought on by uh, years of abusing his body, smoking and drinking, and yes, uh, a cocaine habit. Now, let me explain about that uh, cocaine habit. Um, Larry didn't do coke all the time. Um, you know, Phil suspected that maybe he was addicted and that kind of thing. But uh, I taught with him and I never knew anything about him using cocaine at all. Um, and we were good friends and I was at his house all the time and different things like that. So we had dinner regularly. Um, what he used uh, speed and other drugs for and cocaine, he used it to engage in marathon writing sessions. And he would sometimes work for uh, 24, 36 hours at a time and nonstop. And that's what, um, you know, uh, David St. John was talking about and other people who knew him well were talking about when they said that he privileged his writing over his own health. And um, that's, that's a better way of looking at it because I wouldn't want people to think, oh, good. I, if I just did a lot of coke, I could write like Larry Levis. <laughs> it's like, no, that isn't what's going to happen. You're just going to end up dead. Uh, so don't do that. Um, and I tell my students that all the time, that, you know, the stuff you write when you're drunk or stoned or anything else is going to usually be garbage. So um, there, there can be exceptions to that, but that's only that, that exception would only happen if you were really working on your poetry all the time and you were totally in touch with it and you were really committed to it. And then it wouldn't matter what stupid stuff you were doing. You know, it would just, the poetry would take over. So um, yeah, that was that was a strange part of it. 
there were lots of challenges. Uh, his first wife, when Michelle first talked to her about talking with about Larry, uh, she wanted nothing to do with the project at all. And she wasn't going to speak to us. And uh, the cinematographer we had with us when we went over to her house one day, really kind of desperately hoping that she would talk to us because we had to leave California. And she was one of our last uh, appointments that we had. And uh, the cinematographer we had with us said, look, here's what you do. You just go to her door, knock on the door. And when she opens the door, just stick a camera in her face and say, what do you think about Larry Levis? And we said, uh, if we do that, no one will ever speak to us again in the whole world of poetry and the whole thing will be over with. And uh, no, that's a very poor idea. So Michelle just quietly during our discussion, I was having kind of a heated discussion with him about this. M Michelle just quietly got out of the car and went to the door, knocked on the door, and she disappeared into the house. She was there for several hours. I'm not quite sure what all went on. But she came back out and said, she's agreed that she would like to talk to us. And that is one of the reasons why I've said many times that the only person who could have made this film is Michelle, because of several significant factors. One, her personality, her kindness, her generosity, her intelligence. But another factor was that she actually is a publishing poet. And um, one of the things that, I'll stop talking here because I want Michelle to talk, but one of the things I'll point out to you is that most of the films made about poets and I could go on naming them. I'll just name the one about Merwin, right? Um, it's about everything but his poetry. It's about his preserving uh, palm trees in Hawaii, which is a wonderful thing that he did. He was very committed to ecology and to preserving nature on his farm that he has. And, and so that was all wonderful. But I think he wrote, read one poem during the entire movie, you know? And um, there was not much about poetry. so. When Michelle was trying to decide how to go about narrating the film, she decided to have Larry's words narrate the film, actual poetry by a poet. And the reason why I was reading the poems, maybe you noticed that, that that voice was mine. We messed with my voice so it wouldn't be immediately identified as me. Oh, we did some echo on it and we did some things with it. But the, well, reason, we... the reason why we did that is the recordings of his voice were poor. And we just, we, we set it up well, so that it, it was, was as if the poems were speaking themselves. That was the intention. It, it was that, but I mean, and I wouldn't have minded the poor quality so much, but I, I wanted to have the selection of all of his poetry. So I think we were gonna be limited if we, were on, if we only had the use of the poems that he uh, recorded, right? So I, I didn't want to have Larry Levis reading a couple poems and then Greg reading a couple poems or someone else, you know, I wanted that to be uniform. So that, that sort of became one of the decisions we had to make. Are we going to limit it to the only poems he read aloud or are we going to have the whole, you know, his whole body of work to choose? Well well, Greg, I have to say you're busted because I recognized your voice pretty quickly and I haven't known you very long, <laughs> but, it, but you did a wonderful job of reading um, and I really appreciated it because it, you're a good, great reader and it, it is very helpful to have things enunciated well. Well, the test of that we was had it. We had a very sophisticated uh, technique for recording his voice, which involved being in our hallway with a blanket over Greg's <laughs> head. Because <laughs> yeah, every time we'd start recording, someone would start up a lawnmower or there would be some kind of outrage happen. So we got into the room that was most insulated from the outside. We live in a little cottage here. And uh, so we find a place to record the, the, uh, the poems. But I hope the effect is that uh, it feels as if the poems are coming out of themselves rather than out of some particular person. And, um, other questions? We're happy to talk with you about it. How, how about the, the music for the film? I, I really enjoyed that um, that music uh, it, 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 it's immediate, it's immediately um, rare in, right. in, a, in a sense uh, so how, how did that come about 
Uh, thank you for for commenting on that. I'm so um, I'm so proud of the music for the film. Uh, the film, the, the mu most of the music is actually by the artist uh, Sam Beam, who's otherwise known as Iron and Wine. Um, he, uh, he is a big fan of Levis's and he also is a fan of Norman Doobie who appears in the, poem, in the film. And um, I was studying with Norman at the time, studying poetry and Norman would come, come into the classroom and say how Sam had contacted him. And he said, Sam wants to use my poems for some of his music and my, you know, for the lyrics. And um, so I started thinking about Sam Beam because I was hearing about him all the time through Norman Doobie and, uh, and started really thinking of, and that was around the same time I was, you know, working on the editing of the film. So I started listening to, to Sam's music and just kind of fell in love with it. I mean, the guy is just absolutely, you know, amazing. I, th I think he's just terrific. And the fact that he reads poetry, you know, if you read his lyrics, they're, they're really sophisticated lyrics. I mean, he, is a, he really reads deeply. Um, and so I thought that would be a natural fit. And, uh, you know, he was so generous he he wrote it. He actually wrote the entire soundtrack to the film without seeing the film. He had just read uh, Levis's work and got got it into his blood, you know, absorbed it and sat down and just wrote eleven songs after reading the poetry. Neat. Um, and so then I got the 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 music and then I placed it through the film. So that, that's how that whole process worked. But I think it just, it worked really, really well. Um, yeah. Sam, Sam came out for the world premiere out in San Francisco. And, you know, I got to meet him out there and he, he came up on stage and, you know, was generous not only with his music, but with his, with his time, you know, and uh, he, he was just, you know, he was terrific, yeah. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. yeah, he's a wonderful artist. He came through Richmond recently, and we went to his concert. And we, uh, because of Michelle's star status, we got backstage passes. And when we went back there to talk to him, we didn't talk about music. We talked poetry the whole time. We talked what he was reading lately, and who should we recommend to him, and everything. So, uh, if you want to vote for a really great guy who is a wonderful uh, supporter of poets and poetry, it's it's Sam Beam of Iron and Wine. And he's also happens to be a pretty good musician. <laughs> he fills concert halls around the world, you know. So he, he's a he's a bona fide figure in the musical world. So we've we've had book ads, very brief ones. But um, Michelle and Greg, do you want to put in the chat box um, how we can obtain copies of your movie? Uh, uh, the movie sure. The movie is available. The film is available on Amazon as well as uh, through the Canopy Educational Streaming Service. Okay, so when you get a chance, can one of you type that link into the um, chat box, please? Yeah. yeah, I don't know if we have that link. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Okay. And, and the other thing is that I probably should uh, show you is that um, because uh, I think it was Terry who was mentioning that a film, Michelle collected over 200 hours of interviews for the film that we had to be boiled down to 90 minutes. So it meant that some interviews didn't make it in at all and other interviews with really famous articulate marvelous human beings who are poets, two poet laureates, you know, on and on, um, were, were distilled into just a few minutes. So what we did was we transcribed all of the interviews and then uh, they, we've published them now in a book. So uh, we're not really that interested in selling books. But anyway, here is, uh, it's called Prismatics. And these are the, the name of the book is Prismatics. It's also available on Amazon. And um, it is the transcriptions of the full length interviews with Phil Levine and Charles Wright. And they had much more to say than the film could let them say. In fact, to be honest, like we were at Phil, Levine, Phil Levine's house for two days filming. And we could have just made a film out of that. 
that would have been great. <laughs> you would have laughed, you would have cried, you would have been amazed, you would have been gotten great advice. And we felt that would, that could not be sacrificed. Uh, so um, we, we did, uh, it took several years to get this published. <laughs> and uh, the film itself, she, Terry was asking how long it took you to make the film. Oh, about 10 years when it was all said and done, yeah. So quite a long project. Uh, it was all uh, done mostly with our funds, although we did run a, uh, um, what do you call that thing? A Kickstarter. Kickstarter. And that was one of the reasons why I think you decided you wanted to go forward with the project because of the Kickstarter. Explain that. Yeah, well, I, I, I wasn't really even kind of thinking I was making a film at first. I just was sort of doing interviews and talking to people and, um, and uh, you know, I, I did go to film school, but it, I, it had been a long time since I'd been to film school. And so making a film was just not on my radar. Um, and so anyway, I, I did do a couple interviews, talk to some people here in Richmond, some former students and colleagues and decided to just see what would happen if I started a Kickstarter campaign, you know, out of, more out of curiosity, honestly, than anything. And the response I got was so large and overwhelming with all of these people, fans and former students and, you know, real, actually it was mostly fans that just said, yes, I really would love to see this and I'll, I'll give you 30 bucks or 50 bucks or 20 bucks, you know? And so it really was at that point, I think it raised over $12,000 and and that, that's sort of what sealed the deal for me. And I thought, okay, well, now I have to do this because I've got all these people that have contributed some money. You know, they're gonna to wanna to see something for that. And uh, so that, that was really what pushed it over into you know, a, a real project that I was gonna move forward with, yeah. Yeah, the, the whole project never was a money-making operation. <laughs> I, I laugh because uh, it cost us tens of thousands of dollars to make this film. And, uh, but uh, that didn't matter to either one of us because it was a story that really needed to be told. And I use the film in my own teaching and I know that people across the country use it. And it's a film which really introduces young writers to the idea of what kind of commitment you have to make to the art of writing if you're really going to be serious about it. I see John nodding his head there. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And uh, so uh, it's, it's not a matter of, uh, it depends on uh, your own individual psychology and your ability to do it. But um, um, a lot of us who do poetry, Phil Levine talks about this, uh, what work is, you know, uh, Larry, despite some people thinking that he, Phil's saying he grew up on one side and the workers were on the other, but he did not grow up rich. He did not grow up wealthy. His dad was a farmer, you know. So um, uh, those folks who find their way into poetry because it matters so much to them, they really can't do anything else but do that. Um, the money doesn't matter. That's, that's not the principal thing. It's the art itself. And so the devotion that you have to the art Larry was completely and utterly committed to his writing. And that came first. That was a problem sometimes in his life. It always is for artists where the art comes first. Um, but I think that he also did something for all of us with the poems that he wrote because they continue to inspire my students and uh, other writers. Uh, every year there is uh, the awarding of the Larry Levis Reading Prize at Virginia Commonwealth University for the best first or second book pu published in that year. Solma Sharif has won it and uh, Ricky Laurentis and Roger Reeves and I could go on naming all these wonderful young poets who have won that award. And in every case, without any design in this, they'll come along and they'll say, you know, Larry Levis was a very important influence over me at this point or that point in my writing career. And uh, I think that he is a healthy force in the world of poetry for writing stronger and better spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and technically. You know, just a real, a real it's a real adventure reading his poems. And Stan Plumley was right about what he said about him. 
how he took these, this risk of just pushing himself out beyond anything that was safe. What do you have to say? No, that's great. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Um, thank you. I've used this movie in classes. I've probably seen it more times than anybody except for you two. I've watched the movie more than 25 or 30. No, no exaggeration. Yeah, I have it on canopy. When I wash dishes, it's always on. It's like I can lip sync the movie at this point. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for making it. Um, earlier, I answered a question about influences and I think I misheard the question. I was kind of rattling off my first influences, but without a shadow of a doubt, Larry Levis is probably the single singular most impactful poet in my life. And a lot of it has to do with what you just named, you know, his dedication uh, to what it takes, to the craft. And um, really, you guys, thank you, thank you, thank you for, for making this film. Well, you know, Thank you for using it. That's yes, that's that's, that's really. I am always just personally so happy when I meet people that use it in the classroom, it's especially. It, it's that's one of the reasons you know I made it. So thanks, John, for for saying that. Thank you. Yeah, John, that that really is uh, that's very meaningful, and I I think that um, we we share that sense that this is a poet that if you give him to young writers their work will immediately expand. And uh, that's, that's why we do it, you know, because that's what happened to us. <laughs> you know, being his buddy was wonderful. And you, anybody who knew him loved him. No, really, the, the, the people that got to know him really loved him. And part of the reason why I'm so happy that this film exists in the world is that now others get to have that sense of his complexity, of his intensity, uh, the richness of the poetry that he wrote. And, um, and one of the things that often happens is at the end, people will say, well, I didn't know Larry Levis before this, and now I think I'll go get some of his books. And that's, it's like, what, what else could be better than that? Yeah. Well, and it's yeah. especially important to, to read the books because, you know, the, the film is, of course, you know, not supposed to be a substitute for the work. Um, because, you know, as you saw in the film, some of the poems uh, just are eight, nine, ten pages long, you know, as a, a writer of long poems, right? Um, you know, so I could only, uh, you know, if I was going to do that, I would, ha that would just, you know, I, I could have made a couple different films and that would have been one of them to just feature the work in that way. They're so expansive and um, it would have been a different, uh, movie of course but that would be tempting for me to make too because the long poems i love um, but as you saw we had to use short excerpts and we only got to include one full poem uh, that's the last poem at the end the so end. so that's probably you know i've been asked after i've screened the film do i have any regrets and I don't have any regrets with the film. However, I, I would like to have included more of the poetry, you know, longer excerpts or even longer full poems. But, you know, that was just one of those decisions we had to, to make. Um, and in the end, hoping that the film serves as an introduction. It stands on it on its own, but that it also serves as an introduction to the work, right? to go to, to, to read the work. Yeah, it does, it definitely does. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that you used it in your teaching. I, I keep saying to people, you know, the, even the wonderful uh, films made about Maya Angelou, you know, well, Maya Angelou was a dancer and an actress and she had this very rich, long life of all different kinds of things. So by, what did they use in the film? Well, they're going to go for the dancer and the singer and that kind of thing. And so you only get a little taste of her poetry. You do get some, but just a little taste. So um, I was just very happy that Michelle ultimately decided to use lots of poetry, lots of poems, line, good lines of poetry. And I got to read them. <laughs> Anything else? I saw Ethelbert there. Uh, yeah. Ethelbert, you're being quiet. I'm sure you have well, something to I say here. What I was interested in is that, and it sort of came out at the end, and I'm right now looking at um, women in the 1950s, visual artists, and also the writers, that you got people to talk about these relationships, you know, 
Uh, many times if someone's married or have girlfriends, you know, someone doesn't want to be in the film, doesn't want to tell you the story, even though it's key to the narrative. And so I felt that the fact that sometimes people can put their own personal problems aside um, and, and get that because when you look at the history, so much is can be discovered from talking to the wives and, 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 and the um, the girlfriends. I mean, that's is, that's just part of the literary history. And sometimes it's in letters and diaries and, and sometimes what happens, sometimes the material is destroyed and you just don't have it. We were we were really lucky too with uh, with Philip Levine, I think, because he was such a resource, and also it was that, and also he was ready, you know, because I think of his age and and where he was in his life, he was ready to just talk, you know, and I think that was true with um, David St. John as well, and even Carolyn Forche and. Um, you know, Carol Muskie Dukes. I think some time had really, you know, so much time had passed that they were kind of, they were, I felt like they were ready, you know. Yeah, but Chuck, but Chuck Rosenstein was still burning stuff in his house. <laughs> <laughs> there was actually one wife who refused to be involved. Yeah, she, the, the, the third wife um, was, kind of dancing with me, you know, for the whole making of the film, she would go through these periods where she would reach out and want to be involved. And then she would, you know, recoil or come back to herself. And so there was this dance for a long time with her. And in the end, she ended up not wanting to, to be involved. But then uh, when I showed the film out in Utah, she came up to me at the very end of the film and introduced herself and I was just shocked. You know, it was one of the real surprises of this, of the whole process of making the film was when she introduced herself to me and kind of apologized for that back and forth. And so we, you know, I had the feeling she wanted to say more, uh, you know, there was this sort of something was left unsaid, but she still wasn't ready. So it was sort of awkward, but um, but I'm you know I, I'm glad that that I got to meet her. But yes, yeah, she was she was sort of you know touch and go with her. Well, Sheila, uh, Larry's sister was able to summarize the story of that marriage pretty well when she said they only had one really valuable possession, which was his sports car, which she took off. <laughs> she left. So, <laughs> and Larry did occasionally uh, refer to uh, that particular marriage as one of his bigger mistakes. So, uh, <laughs> and he had made a few. So, anyway, <laughs> uh, maybe that was all that needed to be said. Was what she said. Maybe there wasn't a lot more to that because she wasn't a literary person. His other wives were literary. They were literary, and they they were writers, and they knew what they were talking about when they would talk about his work or about their own work you know so thank you so much for that barbara terry do you want to say some closing remarks here i was going to and that just my brain went in a completely different direction okay uh well don't be writing poems off the cuff <laughs> john and ethelbert thank you for staying but i don't have to thank you because it was well worth your time i know you enjoyed it and um Oh my gosh, I'm just speechless. I should say more closing words. Oh, I know, the two more books to give away. Um, this is by, um, Bill Gloss's Personal Geography. Oh, she's not here anymore, but April Asbury. You here, number one. I'm sure she'll be and, really happy. Uh, yes. Uh, my book, Between Then and Now, it's a chapbook. Uh, Leslie and Emerson. She was number five. That's it. Okay, so thank you, Kathleen. You have really done the lion's share here. And thank you, David, for keeping me on track with the bylaws and the rules. I appreciate that. It's hard to not get absorbed into the poetry and to stick with the um, business end of the meeting. And actually, that shows how good everyone's poetry was. I appreciate it. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care.